So welcome again. I think we're good to start. Um, this is a day zero session in the context of the SDG Bergen Conference. So thank you for joining. It's a joint session organized by SOS UK and the International Association of Universities. And we will be talking about the topic of the whole institution approach for education for sustainable development, ESD, and the sustainable development goals, the SDGs. So just very quick, some housekeeping rules. I already said that, so please keep yourself muted as well for the participants and the speakers. And um, please um, be aware that this is also being recorded and will be used by IU and possibly for others that are not able to join us today. Feel free to ask comments in the chat box and then later we can also um, have a more engaging discussions. Um, so just to let you know, we will start by a quick um, introduction. So my name is Isabel Thoman and I work at the IAU as a program officer for higher education and research for sustainable development. Then I will be giving the floor to Sonia from SOS, who will be talking a bit about the whole institution approach and how we would understand it in this context. And we will hear from some examples from practice, from higher education um, around the world as well. So yes, please uh, mute yourselves if you're not already muted, that would be great. Um, and then we will be coming to a moderated discussion and some conclusions here as well. Just to kick off the discussion, we have prepared a Mentimeter um, that I invite you to, to look at. Just... Um, like that. That is a problem if you have two screens open and you want to uh, present one. So the first question that we will have is a question on how you understand sustainable development. So what, uh, what do you associate with education for development and universities? I'm just quickly going back to the slides, apologies for that. I put, um, I put the information for the Mentimeter in the chat box so everyone can go to mentimeter.com and enter the code and you'll be able to access the questions that we'd like to ask you. Thank you so much, Sonia. There it is. Okay. <laughs> so we will give you a couple of um, well moments still. So the Mentimeter is open. You can uh, respond to them also uh, throughout um, the presentations. Um, there you have the code and there you have also the, the QR code. It's the same as in the chat. And we will be getting back um, to that in a bit later as well. So just very briefly to introduce um, the IAU and where I'm sitting at, which is the IAU um, Secretariat based in Paris at uh, UNESCO. Um, we've been created by UNESCO over 70 years ago, and we are still based here and working very closely, of course, with um, UNESCO, but mainly with our members. So we have over 600 members in 120 countries, mostly higher education institutions and organizations, um, but also some affiliates. We work on the World Higher Education Database, um, which is a global page for accredited institutions and also some other information on higher education systems. And we work on research publications and um, um, organizing networking opportunities also for our members. But our work circulates around four priorities, which are leadership, digital transformation, um, internationalization and sustainable development. So the session today is set in the context of this priority of HESD, higher education and sustainable development. Um, with this mission, like this um, priority, really try to enhance the engagement of um, universities uh, with topics of related to sustainable development in different di dimensions, teaching and learning, research, campus activity and student engagement. Um, for instance, we have a IU cluster network, which is a network of good practices and um, also a platform, the IU HESD portal that will help and also some other initiatives that I think Sonia will get to in a minute just very briefly also here because I'm I'm conscious of time um why are we working with ESD and the SDGs well it's really a backdrop 
um, of a lot of action. It's a framework that is uh, holistic and that can be used interdisciplinary and also using a whole institution approach, which we'll get to as well in a minute. Um, and it allows us to, to bring in students, to bring in everyone at the university and have this element also of co-creation um, in, in our work. Um, these slides will be shared later, so that's why I'm just skipping through them a bit quickly. Here you can see our cluster networks. I'm also very happy that we have two speakers that are also um, in this uh, base at universities that are engaged in the cluster, the University of West Indies and uh, the University of Costa Rica are the two colleagues that will be presenting in a bit as well. And um, yeah, here also included some example activities the portal I already mentioned. We conducted a big research project that we presented last year to see how universities work with the SDGs. Um, and we have a publication series, for instance, on the SDGs. Um, this is the report for the survey that I also invite you to read. This just again saying I will be sharing these later. Um, and just without further ado now, and I, I know people are still entering the room, so welcome those that are joining us now. So we're just in the beginning, just in the introductions, and um, I'm be passing on now the microphone to Sonia, who will be presenting um, a bit more on what we mean by this whole institution approach um, and to ESD and to the SDGs. So yeah, Sonia, the floor is yours, thanks. Thanks, Isabel. Thanks for that introduction and um, setting the scene for the, the session. Um, hi, everyone. Really looking forward to spending the next hour and a half with you talking about how we can use a whole institution approach to embedding sustainability and the SDGs in our institutions and in education. Um, sorry, next slide, please, Isabel. So just a quick introduction to who I am and where I'm coming from before I start talking a bit more about setting the scene. Uh, I'm Sonia Press. I'm a senior project manager working in uh, education programs at an organization called Students Organizing for Sustainability. So I'm based in the UK um, cohort of SOS, but um, I do a lot of our education work through our international program as well, Students Organizing for Sustainability International. We're a group that um, supports students and youth groups to globally lead on sustainability and climate justice. And so what we do is we develop and deliver a range of different programs and workshops um, advocacy campaigns to get students to not just learn about the challenges that we're facing that we need to overcome, but to develop skills and attributes to actually take lead and to play a leadership role in shaping our future and shaping education. And so a key focus of ours is partnering with students, empowering students for that whole institution approach to embedding sustainability in learning. Um, so next slide, please, Isabel. So I'll talk a bit more about uh, a piece of work that SOS and IAU have been delivering together um, starting in October of 2023. But before I do that, I just want to set the scene and talk about what we actually mean by a whole institution approach. It's a term that's used quite often when we talk about this kind of work. But well, what do we actually mean by it and why is it so important? So firstly, what we mean by whole institution approach is engaging all stakeholders within our in institution to co-create changes to embed education for sustainable development and the SDGs in learning. And when I say stakeholders, I mean students, academic staff, lecturers and professors, professional staff, so that could be staff within estates, food and dining, careers, um, student recruitment, globalization, for example, as well as senior leaders and managers. And this can also include engaging with the community that you're located in for that whole institution approach. So really looking at all the various stakeholders um, within mm -hmm. your institution and more widely for how you can uh, use this whole institution approach. Next slide, please, Isabel. And so how can we do this? I think it's easier said than done when I say, okay, you have to, you know, it's important to engage all these stakeholders, but what are some ways that we can actually do this? So the first thing we can do is by embedding sustainability, the SDGs and education for sustainable development across all student learning. So often when we say student learning, there's a key, there's a focus on the formal curriculum, which looks at lectures and essentially everything that a student must go through to obtain a formal qualification. But what's really important and what will help us to use that whole institution approach is to look at the other ways that students are learning in our institutions as well. So we have the formal curriculum, 
but we also have the informal curriculum. So the informal curriculum looks at um, societies, extracurricular activities that students might take part in. It looks at anything that a student might choose to engage with that doesn't necessarily contribute to their degree or their diploma or their qualification. And then we also have the subliminal curriculum. So the subliminal curriculum is, um, I think, a fascinating uh, way that students learn. We also sometimes call it the hidden curriculum. And what it is, is it's the way that a student learns within our institution simply by being a member of the institution, simply by being a part of the community. And that's through the values and the, um, the, what, the sort of hidden messages that we're communicating to students that are evident in our policies, in our strategies, and the signage that we have around our institutions. So one way that we can really take this whole institution approach forward is by embedding the SDGs and sustainability more widely in all spheres of student learning and not just focusing on the formal curriculum. And this way we engage with staff and students who are involved in estates and food and dining and career services and globalization, etc. Next slide, please. Another way to ensure that we have an, a whole institution approach is to ensure that there's sustainability, the SDGs embedded across all levels of our institution. This can really help us to engage students, staff, and our senior leaders. So really looking at those stakeholders across the institution. Um, there's three levels that we like to think of within an institution. There's changes that can take place from the top down. So looking at our policies, our strategies, um, our quality assurance for our modules and our courses. There's the bottom up, looking at the way we engage with our students, our trade unions perhaps. And then there's the middle out, the way educators might engage with students or the way that educators might engage with senior leaders. So really that link between the top down and the bottom up. And so to really take that whole institution approach for embedding the SDGs and ESD into learning, we need to look at all spheres of learning, but we also need to look at the different levels at which we can make these changes from the top down, from the bottom up, and from the middle out. Next slide, please, Isabel. Um, so it's some, I'll, I'll um, go through the next couple of slides really quickly because it's it'll be nice to hear from Kevin and Anna about tangible examples. Um, but some benefits to a whole institution approach. Firstly, it makes education more fit for purpose for all stakeholders when we can all contribute, when we can all make decisions together and co-create what our learning looks like. It makes our education relevant to the students that are studying it, to the educators that are delivering it, to the senior leaders that are uh, have oversight over it, and it makes it more engaging for everyone to have a say in how their education is delivered and how it aligns with the SDGs. It also means that there's increased capacity for sustainability and the SDGs across the institution. If we're taking a whole institution approach, looking at changes across levels, looking at all kinds of student learning, it means work to embed the sustainable development goals is spread out evenly amongst colleagues, hopefully evenly amongst colleagues and students. And it's not really just resting on a couple of people to take this work forward. It means that there's handovers, the legacy of the work continues when students graduate or when there's staff turnover. And it means that there's changes and interventions across all areas and levels for institutional change. So it means it's meaningful institutional change. And then, of course, it means that there's more access to professional development, learning opportunities if everyone's able to engage in this work and then do it together. Next slide, please, Isabel. And I just want to um, take a step back and zoom out a bit and think about the idea of democratizing education. So part of the reason why taking this a uh, whole institution approach to embedding ESD and the SDGs in teaching and learning is important is because it helps us to democratize education, to engage our students and to really work with them in a way that they um, that empowers them and provides them with ownership over how they're learning and how they can use their learning. So just a quick um, explanation of what I mean. Um, we wrote this with a trade union that we work with in the UK called the University College Union. Democratizing education means to engage both students and staff as active participants in the shaping, development, creation, and facilitation of their workplaces and learning spaces. It promotes establishing and ensuring mechanisms for student and staff co-creators and active participants in development and decision making spaces. By meaningfully engaging staff, students, and others in a democratized learning and working experience, we're all empowered to activate our potential to contribute towards a better world. So that's the sort of broader lens. Um, so that's set, setting the scene, setting the context for what we mean by a whole institution approach. Um, what I'll do now is I'll hand over, we have two speakers, Kevin Manning from the University of the West Indies and Anna Duran from University of Costa Rica. So we'll hear from them and then 
I'll come back in and talk about some work that we've been doing with the IAU. Um, so you can have some sort of concrete ideas of what's taking place and then we'll have a discussion. Um, next slide, please, Isabel. Yeah, fab. So yeah, really delighted to, to introduce Kevin Manning from the Global Partnerships Office at the University of the West Indies to talk more about work around a whole institution approach at the University of the West Indies. Thanks so much, Kevin. I just want to make sure everyone can hear me closely. Um, good morning, everyone. Just uh, so someone responded. Did you hear me okay? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, yes, just to jump right in, as you know, my name is Kevin Manning. I'm coming to you from the University of the West Indies. Currently, I'm based in Barbados. Um, and right now, I just want to take a step back. As you would know, when it comes to ESD and sustainability, there are many different definitions. The first one, many of you will be very familiar with. Um, but so I will just want to jump to the second one, where you see that ESD is essential for achievement of a sustainable society and is therefore desirable at all levels of formal education and training as a non as well as in non-formal and informal learning, just to mention much of what um, Sonia would have just said. So how do we ensure sustainability? And one example that is quite evident to me is, and this being the beginning of the year, is that we have to ensure as institutions and individuals, we have a level of um, lifestyle changes. And an example of this would be our New Year's resolutions. And the beginning of the year, many of us set out to ensure to make these changes, to see that we want to be in the gym more, but we are not always as consistent as we want to be. So these lifestyle changes is something that we have to be able to say to ourselves and our institutions, this is what we need to do. We don't really see sustainability in, in much of our work as educators. And this is primarily something that was very evident within the Caribbean region. So how do we as an institution set about ensuring sustainability um, and ensuring that is something that is going to be a very evident for time going forward. So one of the main plans that the University of the West Indies has undertook to go forward would be to ensure that we have implemented sustainability plans. And this has proven to be quite useful as one of the main areas of this is that we would have seen much of the work which we are continuing to roll out early this year. Um, late last year, we had those discussions is with Sonia and her team at the Responsible Futures at SOS UK. Um, also, additionally to that, we also have established the Global Institute for Climate Smart and Resilient Development at the University of the West Indies and the International School for Sustain for Development Justice, um, the ISDJ for short. Um, the Global Institute is one that is focuses very much on sustainability. Much of our work in climate and climate action takes place from this very much institute. It's a virtual institute and the ISDJ is intended to undertake and take an analysis of every single SDG or 17 um, goals that have, have been established. But one of the challenges is that we treat sustainability as a theoretical concept and we don't really go about it with the practical applications. And many behavioral scientists will indicate that it takes 18 to 60 plus days to formulate a new habit. So when we look at sustainability and ensuring ESD, we have to be able to take an understanding as to how best we're going to go forward from this um, to make a difference. So for the UWA, we have learned over the years and the challenges that we faced is that many different aspects of learning and education is present. Sonia would have mentioned aspects of informal and formal learning. Um, and for the UWA, we saw that there's a challenge with the industry versus academia paradigm. And this will be explained a little later in some slides. But we recognize that contextualized learning is key in ensuring sustainability in our education for our students. 
So for education and sustainable development, they must work together. And we've witnessed that many universities, they focus on the theoretical. Many of you in your work will probably focus on the theoretical and you probably incorporate the practical, but many of your colleagues just focus on the theoretical if it's a philosophical science. But industry seeks the practical as it retains real world implications. So in a global environment where jobs are constantly changing, um, we see the evidence every day. Um, what are the requirements to ensure that the SDGs and sustainability are present? Practicality must boost the theory. So as I mentioned before, the industry academia paradigm, and we choose to look at this from a theory of change. So what is this theory of change that we look at? And you can see here a, a, a definition from the United Nations Development Group which is a theory of change is a method that explains how a given intervention or set of interventions is expected to lead a specific development change joined on a causal analysis based on available evidence. So why is this important? Sustainability is difficult. <laughs> it is no easy way to ensure sustainability. It requires work. Evidence is needed to support what is being done, and you have the in involved stakeholders, many of them being the industry, and all of this is grounded by policy and strategy. And you can see here a quick graph as to how we go from idea to implementation, um, many of them involving many of your work, um, and then we have the policy enablers, we have the industry being the private sector, um, the global community of practice, to be able to ensure that students go from and are well-rounded, not just in areas of theoretical, but also have the practical implications to be able to function in a global community. So in conclusion, education for sustainable development is critical in many areas. Um, however, in order to effectively achieve it, integral changes must be undertaken. HEIs, such as the University of the West Indies, have to ensure that sustainability continues in all aspects of our work. There's no way to get around it. But education is first and foremost as it bridges the gap between industry and academia, and it prepares our students for the future. Sustainability plans also go quite far. It is not simply enough to teach, but as an institution. And as many of you may be familiar with the University of West Indies, we are spread across the Caribbean region. There's no real way of saying we are one campus, we can do everything in one go. We have to be able to ensure that it's a situation where we can continue to embrace sustainability because it's very important going forward. So I think at this point, um, I'll hand back to Isabel and we can continue to take a look at you know ESD going forward. So thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. And it's really interesting to hear what is going on at, at such a big and uh, spread out um, institution such as the University of the West Indies. Um, so thank you for your presentation. And I think if you agree, it would be also great to share your slides after with the colleagues that have attended. So now I will go to a second um, example from practice um, uh, to the University of Costa Rica and to Ana Duran, um, who will be presenting uh, today. So uh, yes. Perfect, Anna, you already have a screen share. Yeah, okay, thank you so much, we can see it. So no. the floor is yours, Anna. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for this space to share some of the work that we've been doing at the University of Costa Rica. So the University of Costa Rica has three main working pillars, being one, education, the formation of new professionals, then academic research, and what it's also called um, social action, which is the way in which the university interacts with the communities um, and also participates in the different aspects of living in the country. So we have different approaches in which we focus on the education for the SDG. So uh, for a few years now, a kind of a na national initiative on integration of the SDGs as part of the curricula has been in the works. So when we talk about how are we educating for the SDGs and how also we participate in this education process, we mean that we need a change in the curriculum. So we need to directly include 
the SDGs as part of what we are teaching at the university, but also promoting the development of how the students and then future professionals would be using all this information to part, uh, participate in being actually engaged in the promotion of the SDGs. So we have uh, one approach that is directly linked in the class work, what we are doing in the classroom with the students. And we also have a line of different types of activities, seminars, a lot of workshops that are conducted every year. And these workshops tend to emphasize the interaction with the students, with also other students coming from uh, different institutions in other countries. So for us, it's also very important that the students have the chance and get to know how all other institutions across the world are working uh, with this curriculum development of the SDGs and then expanding the horizons on how to achieve the goals and also how we do in, uh, understand the goals. Part of the work that we do, uh, we like to call it, call it goals for equity and equity for the goals. So there is a strong line on guaranteeing an equalitary access for the education in the country, but also to motivate the university to continue this development, understanding um, that we need to build a better future, but making sure, and that's something that I really like, is making sure in a very strong statement that no one is left behind. It's extremely important for us. So as part of uh, most Latin American universities, public universities and core and contribute to social mobility in the region. So it's extremely important for us to make sure that everyone um, can be participant of these initiatives. It is also very important uh, uh, to depart from this traditional uh, way of education in which all the activities are held in the classroom. So we have the different uh, training workshops and laboratories in which the students can also take part of different research activities directly with different experts, uh, both from Costa Rica and also uh, experts coming from abroad, and then uh, interact through these workshops in trying to solve different um, aspects or problems that we have in particular regions, uh, but encompassing and integrating the overview of you know, how can I link this particular experiment that I am preparing to support or try to achieve uh, one or multiple uh, SDGs at the same time. So making sure also that students have the access to technology, state-of-the-art laboratories, but also uh, can be involved in the development of specific problems and something that's very relevant for us in this approach is these problems are coming from communities. So we have this specific community that has some particular needs and then you know, through this workshop, the students are able to provide solutions for the communities. It is also relevant for us that the students can participate in this type of activities uh, because they can also better understand the national context that we have and the regional context that we have. So it's not only a matter of educating on the SDGs, but also understanding you know, how we can understand and contribute the SDGs uh, goals from our national reality and the different perspectives that we have. And also this has the advantage that makes sure the students also understand that the country also has different realities depending on the region where we are, are located. So uh, trying to summarize, we work on four main different lines, SDGs and future professionals. So how we integrate the SDGs and corresponding strategies as part of the coursework that's kind of very specific in the curriculum, but at the same time provide hands-on training to make sure that we can actually uh, depart from these more theoretical approaches and then participate in more practical work and this kind of future professionals formation for the SDGs strategies. Then we have the university and the community in we have different types of programs. Uh, the one that is perhaps most successful at the moment is the open doors approach. So we have different experimental stations and laboratories in which you know, persons, any person can come in to the open door sessions, then understand what the university is doing, which type of problems we are solving, how these problems are related to the SDGs. And we do this partly in teaching, research, and social extension. These uh, open doors activities are something that are very valuable because 
people get also to know what the university is doing uh, for their communities, but it also works as a very good way in which uh, we can engage younger students from the communities and mostly coming from rural and less privileged areas to join in what we do at the university. Then the context for the SDGs partnership is how the university work through these different types of workshops with other institutions and uh, stakeholders to strengthen the partnerships for the goal at different levels. So regional integration being also part of something that's very relevant to us. Networking is extremely important and it's also very relevant for us that the students can uh, understand how they can also participate in these uh, different types of networks that the university um, is fostering and encouraging uh, so that we can have more integral frameworks on the work with the goals. Just um, to end, a very quick example. So we have different also uh, specific initiatives within these programs, being one of them, the Ibero-American Iber Network, uh, Women Network for Climate Action. With this specific uh, soup program, I would say that's called Tiempo y Clima para vos, that will be weather and climate for you. This program at the moment is working with uh, 230 uh, schools and high schools all across the country, distributed in, in the different regions that we have providing training on how we understand weather and climate and how this is linked to very specific SDGs, they are the ones that are not um, marked in green. And here we have two different levels. So one is trainings and workshops for high school and primary school teachers, and then a specific work that's also done with, with the students. That would be then, uh, this quick summary of our work at the University of Costa Rica with very specific examples. But in a nutshell, our interest is to make sure that the university has an active participation, but is strongly connected with the communities and not you know, different uh, or acting only with the stakeholders, but we want also to interact with all the different actors that are relevant for, the, for reaching the goals. Thank you so much, Anna, for this uh, overview of the initiatives at the University of Costa Rica. And I agree that working with the community is almost as important as working with the people within the university. Um, so that's very great to get some some yeah more concrete ideas how that could happen from from your projects. Um, I will now move on to Sonia. So we have here now two concrete examples how um, how institutional pro projects are implemented at the University of Costa Rica and the University of the West Indies. Um, and now I think uh, Sonia will come back to this idea that she presented earlier, how we understand the whole institutional approach and what we could do about it um, to have these initiatives strongly connected at um, our university or our institution. So Sonia, I think I will be screen sharing. Yes, does that work for you? Please, that would be really good. Okay, perfect. So I'll just uh, share my screen again. Um, we are leaving the Mentimeter open. So if you want to reply to it, thanks Sonia, I shared it before and we will get back to it in the discussion right now. Um, now you go, I think you should be able to see it. I just jumped, there you go. So, yeah, so perfect. the floor is yours. Thank, thank you. you so much. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Kevin and Anna. It was really interesting to hear about what's happening at um, UWI and the University of Costa Rica. And I love the, the sort of approach uh, about working with students, the working with the community and taking it, taking learning from the sort of abstract theoretical to the concrete. I think that's fabulous. Um, so what I'd like to do for the next five to five or so minutes before we begin a discussion, which I'm really, really looking forward to, is talk about work that um, SOS has been doing with the International Association of Universities to support institutions to use and um, uh, yeah use that whole institution approach to ensuring that the sustainable development goals and ESD is embedded into all student learning. Uh, next slide, please, Isabel. So um, we've been working with the uh, with IAU to deliver uh, an international pilot to a program called Responsible Futures. So Responsible Futures is a supported change program um, that partners institutions with their students um, and a, a wide group of stakeholders to work together to embed sustainability in all learning. The Responsible Futures program has actually existed for a decade in the UK. So in 2024, we're celebrating 10 years in the UK. 
last year, um, we, we found that there were so many excellent outcomes, so many learnings, and we wanted to work internationally to be able to engage with institutions all over the world. And so we partnered with the International Association of Universities, and together we're delivering the international pilot to Responsible Futures, and we're working with seven institutions across the world, including the University of the West Indies and, and Kevin and his colleagues. So the program, as I mentioned, is a supported change program for a whole institution approach. Through the program, what we do is we partner students with their institution. We provide, um, provide you with a framework of good practice that's been co-created by all of the institutions that are involved in the pilot. And we support you to engage with that framework to, through a range of different support. It's a, a global network of institutions and students that are working together to embed sustainability and the SDGs and ESD in teaching and learning. And so there's lots of different moving parts that I'm going to um, talk through briefly. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of, um, yeah, I mentioned it's a, it's a global network of institutions and students. So on the screen, we have the current partnerships. Um, in the UK, there's around, there's 18 um, partnerships across, across um, the different countries. And then our international pilot, we have seven institutions across the globe in Canada, Ireland, the Caribbean. So a range of different countries in the Caribbean, um, Zimbabwe, Lithuania. Um, so yeah, and, and, and Western Australia as well. Next slide, please. So Responsible Futures, in a few words, inspiring, reassuring, necessary, exciting, collaborative, passion. Next slide, please. That's from a university staff member who's been involved in the program. So in terms of outcomes to date, so while we currently have um, 25 partnerships globally involved in the program, over the past decade, we worked with 48 institutions and their students, reaching over a million students globally. Through the framework that's provided um, through the program and the different support that we provide to engage with the framework, over 2,000 actions have been taken for education for sustainable development and to embed the SDGs into teaching and learning. A key part of the program is that the institution and their students work on engaging with the framework to progress this work. And then after a year or two of engaging with the framework, we deliver a student-led audit where your students audit you on how they feel you've embedded the SDGs and other um, frameworks around sustainability into teaching and learning. So we've, de we've delivered or supported 47 student-led audits, which have resulted in really, really interesting recommendations from their students on what they think their institutions are doing well, and what they'd like to see them progress in communicated through um, uh, extensive audit reports. Um, and from those audits, we've worked with over 200 students uh, who've led these audits. And it's been a really, really interesting um, process for a lot of students because they don't normally, unfortunately, get the opportunity to play such a strong leadership role in, in the direction their institution is taking for the SDGs and for sustainability. Next slide, please. So looking specifically at the kinds of changes that have been made, um, the framework, the support provided alongside the framework, the audit, all of which has led to changes at all levels of the institutions that have been involved in the program. So from the top down, middle out, and the bottom up. So for the institutions and their students who've been involved in Responsible Futures, we've seen a range of different actions taken to embed sustainability, the SDGs, and ESD in teaching and learning. Some of this includes conducting curriculum audits to identify where ESD and the SDGs uh, are in teaching and learning and to what extent they're embedded, passing policies and strategies uh, that center ESD and the SDGs, creating interdisciplinary experiences for students to engage with the SDGs and uh, other topics around sustainability, diversifying the curriculum, so really looking at who we're learning from and what kinds of knowledge we're, we're producing and exchanging, securing greater resourcing for this work, so ensuring through the, the program that there's people in place who can deliver this work and work with students, and there's um, you know capacity in place for this, budget in place for this kind of work. Um, partnerships, which is the institution and their students have established living lab, living laboratory projects, which is a type of learning that takes learning from the sort of theoretical to experiential cohort working with institutions globally. So we have lots of different meetings throughout the year where we bring together institutions to learn together and talk about their work on responsible futures and on embedding the sustainable development goals in teaching and learning. Um, gaining buy-in from trustees, governors, and senior management. So the program supports institutions to be able to get that buy-in. So again, looking at that whole institution approach 
developing a stronger relationship between the university or the institution and their students and developing stronger working relationships across the institution as well. So as I mentioned um, earlier in the session, looking at the way professional staff might engage with students and might engage with academic staff, et cetera. Next slide, please, Isabel. So this is from a student who was involved in an audit at De Montfort University in Leicester in England. They said, it's important that I've been, been involved with the Responsible Futures Audit. This has literally set the tone for more things I want to discover about my university as a first year student. I'm interested in seeing what they do in the future. So the program facilitates that student leadership and ownership over the work and students that are involved feel as if they're equal because they are um, equal partners in this work. Next slide, please. So a short case study from Manchester Metropolitan University in Manchester in England. Um, it, in 2022, they, uh, they passed a leadership and sustainability strategy, which commits the institution to embed climate change education, uh, including carbon literacy and ESD in all of their courses by 2026. So in 2020, the university embarked upon developing this new strategy and through Responsible Futures, they had a key focus on engaging a broad range of stakeholders, including students. So what they did was they delivered interactive workshops open to all staff and students and a short survey for internal and external stakeholders, which helped them to collect feedback about what the university's key sustainability priorities should be. So for them, this de the development of the strategy wasn't just coming from the top down, but they were opening up those avenues and those channels for all stakeholders within the university community and beyond the university community to be able to feed into that. Uh, they also developed projects to engage students in the development of the new strategy and they ran a student-led campaign to be able to do this. Next slide please. So they said um, the Responsible Futures program has been valuable in providing a framework to encourage action on embedding sustainability across the institution and in catalyzing support from the partnership to enable this. So they saw the program as a, a, a way that they were able to ensure that the strategy and the development of the strategy was a whole institution approach and not just coming from the top down. Next slide, please. Right, so um, that's a, a whistle stop tour of the Responsible Futures program. Um, as I mentioned, we're uh, delivering this program with IAU and we selected seven institutions to be involved in the pilot. What we're doing is launching the program, the official program in October, 2024. So later this year, after we finish co-creating the program with, with the pilot institutions. Um, and so if you're interested in learning more, or if you're if this sounds like something that could be uh, you know, an interesting approach for your institution. We are delivering two online information sessions taking place in March. So one's uh, 12th, 12th of March from 3.30 to 4.30 p.m. and one's on the 14th of March, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. So hopefully that can accommodate different time zones. Um, do keep in touch. My email's on the slide and I'll also put it in the chat. And yeah, if you'd like to learn more about the program, I've put the website uh, on the slide. And um, so yeah, let, let us know if you'd like to chat chat through any of these bits that we've just mentioned. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sonia. Just try to unmute myself and um, change the slides a bit, but thank you for presenting that program. So we really wanted to show also that there is a, also a different way to go about it um, and connecting existing ex um, initiatives at the university. So I think for that responsible future that the program is uh, very helpful and we're very looking forward to hearing also uh, in a couple of months more from the international pilot, um, how what experiences they've made. So we're really just in the, in the first international round um, of this program. And the reason why IAU was a very I'm happy when um, SOS UK approached us for this is that we feel this is a program that really allows to combine existing initiatives, has a strong student element, has a strong ESD element, and also um, the SDGs in there. So it doesn't necessarily have to be two different um, initiatives completely, one for ESD, one for SDGs, but we really encourage, um, yeah, encourage you to connect them and to connect them to the, the work that you are already doing, such as community initiatives that probably existed way before the SDGs. Um, so this is, a, this is a good possibility for that. So now we're moving into the part, which is the moderated discussion. And just um, before I start with the questions, um, I would like to say, uh, give a very like heartfelt thank you for Kevin, Anna and Sonia for, for their presentations today. 
um, and for also joining um, the session. Um, what we will be doing now is I will first go back to the Mentimeter poll and just to give you an idea um, what responses we were able to collect so far. Can you see the word cloud? Yes, I think now at this time it works. So these are the, the words that uh, you in this group, so we're around 30 people and we have received uh, all these responses. So we've been talking about transformation, transformative, about possible challenges. Um, that is also interesting. Um, it has to be very interdisciplinary. It has to have a purpose. So we're really educating the students uh, for, the, for the world and for their further careers and not just for one job, um, but for life. Um, prerequisite, so should be a prerequisite, I hope, in, in most um, careers and maybe for all at some point. Uh, difficult, I would also find it interesting um, later maybe to hear from, from some participants um, that are here with us in the room, what they found especially challenging or what type of, um, yeah, why they associated uh, this exactly with education for sustainable development. Green Campus is a very, very common and very great also initiative to get started and get people um, easily engaged. Um, so these are just some of the, um, yeah, some of the points there. And I have a second question as well for uh, the participants. So after hearing the presentations or from your own um, experience, uh, which activities do you feel are most crucial and most important for advancing education for sustainable development at higher education institutions? And here I would also invite you to go to the link that has been previously shared in the chat, or maybe Sonia, I could ask you to just quickly repost it for those that have joined us um, in the Mentimeter poll. So you will be able to also vote and maybe in a couple of minutes, if we have time, we will come back and see uh, what do you see is the most most crucial aspect. Or maybe it's something that's not in here and you might want to share it in the in the chat as well. Um, so please feel free to, to get involved with this um, as well. Ah, the people are already submitting answers. Okay, it's gonna be a very tight, tight race here. I will stop uh, the sharing from the Mentimeter poll now just to get back a minute to the questions that we have prepared for the discussion. So what I will be doing now is I will give um, each of our speakers for one minute, one minute and a half, the possibility to respond to the first question that you see up on the slide. So what do you think are higher education institutions doing well to embed sustainability and the SDGs? And maybe already the second question, what do you think can be done to, to improve these efforts? Um, very quickly, and maybe I'll start this time with uh, Anna and then invite uh, Kevin and uh, Sonia. Um, and then after that, for those in the room, um, if you would later like to turn on your video and maybe raise your hand, um, we can involve you in the discussion. We'll try our best to um, also involve people in the room because we really want this to be an exchange space of exchange, or if you prefer, you can also use the chat. So yeah. Um, Anna, would you like to comment on the, the first question? Thanks. I think what the, the institutions are doing well now is that they are now aware of the importance of having the SDGs explicit as part of the curricula. And I think that was at the moment it was, it started, it was groundbreaking because academia, even though it's supposedly to be flexible, has a lot of rules. So make kind of strong changes in the curriculum is is a is kind of a very hard task. And sometimes it's not easy uh, for more traditional uh, groups to understand the relevance of this. What's more than now, I think the next step after doing this is how we can ensure that all these changes can be also taught from the practicality, not only kind of learning, you know, we have these goals and we have these strategies and we can do this and that, but actually to engage uh, the people in participating of the, of the strategies. And that also requires the development of different tools that we at the universities still need to work on. Uh, otherwise, these changes in the curriculum would end up being, uh, you know, purely cosmetic additions to the curriculum. And I, and of course, that's not what we want. So we want this to be a, a truly transfer, a true transformation of the way education is. And definitely to extend these efforts, we need to develop more tools. And we also need to, uh, you know, go a step uh, steps ahead 
in making sure we can integrate all this in more practic practical work and and then you no know, truly believe in what the goals uh, that we need um, to achieve the goals. Great, thank you, Anna. So I think I like the idea of putting the strategy into practice and also having everyone on board. And I think that's definitely um, a challenge that a lot of institutions face, that they have structures that are not as flexible um, as we want. And we don't want sustainability to be an add-on. We want it to be integrated also in curriculum and activities. So um, thank you for making that point. Um, Kevin, could I ask you to also um, share your opinion on these questions, please? Sure. Um, I think Anna touched on a very interesting point um, when she mentioned sometimes how higher education has been so traditional um, and it's been, it's been challenging to get new ideas and innovation in, in sometimes the curriculum. And now, uh, I would say within the last five years, you've seen more or less of a change in, in that regard. Um, sustainability is becoming more important as students demand more. Students are asking for something different. Um, and I think that that level of understanding in terms of what higher education institutions are able to offer um, is becoming integral. So changes to the curriculum. And maybe one of the universities in this room are one of the universities that are mandating that every student that comes into the university now knows some level of of sustainability or climate knowledge because that's their reality going forward um fostering levels of innovation and how can sustainable and sustainable development you know be innovated to to be able to boost aspects of 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 education i would have mentioned um previously the aspects of industry versus academia. We are, as an institution, being able to look forward to that and recognizing that, you know, traditional methods aren't working. Um, the institutions, the society are, you know, realities are demanding more. It can, it can no longer be a, a philosophical approach to, to surviving anymore. Um, so I think being able to foster the SDGs, such as the um, University of Costa Rica is doing, University of the West Indies is doing, SOS UK is being able to build on, is is something that we find to be very interesting. And how can these efforts be extended? But the institutions need to buy in. Um, much of the time, you get pushed back at the policy level, at the board level. You know, why is this? you know, something that's coming before me. We need to be able to, you know, say to them, this is the new reality of, of education. And I think that's something that, you know, we need to continue to look forward to do. So yeah, that's my response at this point. Wow, thank you so much, Kevin. Yes, uh, the reality is really <laughs> asking for more than, than, yeah, and the students are asking for more as well. Um, so that's a great, uh, yeah, great point you made there. Sonia, would you like to just uh, connect to that? Yeah, I think I really mirror Kevin and Anna's points. I think in terms of what's doing, what's happening that I, th I think is good is it's becoming more and more mainstream. So I think we used to have conversations about, you know, small things around sustainability, around, you know, recycling. And now we're going beyond that and talking about, um, you know, sustainability on a much larger scale. I think that's fantastic. There's more buy-in from senior leaders, which really supports with capacity and resource. Um, Kevin, I think, yeah, it, I agree with you that institutions are listening to their students more. Um, they're taking that kind of student evidence for wanting to learn about sustainability more seriously. We survey students every year about what they want to learn and how they want to learn. And consistently students tell us they want to learn about sustainability and their institutions or universities are where they should be learning about it. And we use that as an evidence base to universities to and then and, and they work with us um, based off that. Um, I think there's really excellent pockets of innovation amongst educators. So um, on a on a sort of smaller scale, educators across across the world are doing fantastic things to embed sustainability in their teaching and learning. And there's lots of really interesting case studies around that. So lots of good things there. In terms of how can these efforts be extended and improved, I fully agree with um, Anna and Kevin. I think we need to ensure that it's more embedded into um, basically every process, the entire process of developing a module, a course, and, and 
delivering it. So from quality assurance to the outcomes and assessments, we need to ensure sustainability is embedded deeply in all subjects, not just subjects that are traditionally linked um, to sustainability. So um, that's really important. I think another thing is we need to see more of those whole institution approaches. I don't think that's more as widespread as, as widespread as it should be. Every institution has ex like has really interesting pockets of good practice, um, but we can't work in silos. We really need to have that cohesive, joined up approach so we can see exactly what we're doing in our institutions and our way forward. Um, I think we also, Kevin mentioned this, but we really need to focus on skills development as opposed to just the teacher, like how we need to focus not just on what students are learning, but how they're learning and how they're supported to actually develop skills that they can use concretely in the real world to tackle real world challenges. So I think when you think about the SDGs, we need to go beyond just in embedding topics related to the SDGs and teaching and learning to skills development. So how can students actually contribute to overcoming the challenges we're facing. Um, and then lastly, my last point, I'll make it quick, is I think we also need to go beyond. I think the SDGs are an excellent um, shared language. They show us the breadth and the interconnectedness of sustainability, but I'd love to see a stronger focus on climate justice as well and really thinking about those global dynamics um, of what who's going to be impacted by the climate crisis and the disproportionate responsibility around that. Um, so I'd love a, a stronger focus on justice going forward as well. Um, yeah, I think I've summarized my, my general thoughts. Thanks, Isabel. No, that's really great, uh, Sonia, and also great that you bring up uh, climate justice again. And also, I think that links very well to the idea that we had earlier in a presentation um, um, from, from Anna, I believe, when she was saying there's also an idea of equity and access. So I think it becomes very quickly with this approach also a social um, question um, that goes way beyond the environmental dimension of, of the SDGs and of sustainable development, but really also has a very strong yeah, social and community aspect to it. So I've stopped sharing slides so we can better see each other and to also give the chance to um, to some of our participants in the room to either use the chat to ask questions or to use the hand raise function. So it can be a question on one of the initiatives maybe presented or if you um, would like to add something, if you have an initiative at your university that you really want to stress. And also something that I wanted to say is there is quite a bit of tools um, guidelines and helpful resources that we can also use and share. So maybe Sonia, you want to share the link to the student service that you just mentioned. And I was just, um, and I will share it in a minute, thinking of um, UNESCO also has quite a bit on education for sustainable development um, in terms of a toolkit for ESD resources for teachers. Um, so these kind of, um, yeah, these kinds of um, documents and resources are out there already as inspiration. Um, Maybe let me just start with uh, Alejandro because I see your hand is up. So uh, yeah, please, you can yes. take the floor. Thank you very much, Isabel. And thank you, Sonia and Anna and Kevin for sharing with us uh, your experience. Um, it's a pleasure to see faces that I know um, here. And um, about the questions, um, I just lack like to add that um, uh, what the universities are uh, doing uh, well at the moment to embed um, sustainability issues, I would like to remark issues because uh, in a couple of cases, uh, it's not the concept as a whole concept, sustainability in the understanding, uh, but from just uh, environmental perspectives uh, in most cases, and they are well done uh, to embed holistic, as one, uh, these perspectives that address sustainability, mostly like mentioned, environmental um, challenges. Uh, and the second stage, um, a couple of uh, universities embed very well too, the concept of sustainability. But uh, uh, just a couple of them uh, embeef the concept of ESD as a driver of a, or facilitator to address sustainability challenges. And for me, it's a, more than a question, or, or yes, a question how you in your universities, for instance, Kevin and Anna, a, um, change the the concept 
to ESD, even the environmental challenges are now uh, one of the most uh, important topic to address resources of universities and maybe create a competence between the both. Yeah, this is one. How do you achieve to include ESD in the discourse of your university? And second one, and I uh, end with that one, is that we are facing a, a very critical uh, challenge now, and is that um, our institutions could uh, don't distinguish uh, the performance of the university, the stakeholder value that maybe we put a address with those actions and the system-wide impact. Because performance, I mean, from uh, the doors to inside the institutions, but system impact is what the university does outside with the community. And uh, most of them are focused on be a green university, that carbon neutral university, very well, very nice and must be done. But the, the, the goal is my opinion of one institution, such as one university is to transform the systems, to transform people outside, yeah? And this is uh, my comment and uh, question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro. And this is a challenging, a very challenging question, I think, also for universities. Um, you are, uh, I just wanted to say, you've been researching that topic quite a bit and you're an expert on all ESD as well. So I think that's we're very specific questions already. So um, I wonder if any of you, Kevin, Sonia, Anna, would want to um, dive in into either balancing, I think, the focus on climate and um, um, act, activism at universities and also yeah, the, the, the systemic. Um, yeah. I, I'd like to, to join in on that. I think the most challenging thing is that because of the traditional way universities have been conceived, it is very common that we get things like mandates. You know, we have to do this, and it's more like this top-down approach. When you go and work with the community, the needs, the reality is most of the time extremely different from what you have from the university mandate. So uh, I think in this case, uh, one good strategy um, to solve this is meet the top-down approach with a bottom-up approach in the middle so that we have all these policies coming from the universities interested in, you know, we need to work toward this, for example, with the, with the case for climate action and carbon neutrality, uh, which is very important, but we also need to understand, for example, if there's pollution in a community, uh, why they are using this specific production system, what are the conditions that they have that sometimes enforce them to not being that sustainable. It's not only a matter of telling the community you have to be sustainable, but the universities also have to provide them with the tools. And in this sense, the co-creation of knowledge is extremely relevant. You cannot just go to a community and tell them what to do. And I think you know the co-creation is perhaps one of the best solutions for that case. Thank you, Anna. Um, Kevin, do you and, uh... Uh, sure, I'll take on uh, uh, swing at it um, in terms of answering that question effectively. Um, and I think Alejandro, to be more precise, is how to achieve ESD in our discourse or the balance between environment and ESD. Just want to be sure I'm answering the right question. Um, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, how do you uh, shift to to change from just one unidimensional perspective of sustainability, as a name, uh, environmental uh, challenge, to a holistic challenge, name ESD or sustainability as a concept? Well, I think in order to, to answer that question, and I think from an institutional perspective, I don't think we've, we've been able to make the shift holistically and be able to say um, this is 
what focus we were on and this is the focus we choose to be on. I think at a stage for the institution, um, the institution has decided that we're going to do both. Um, and we're going to push environment, we're going to push climate. And ASD has recently came about to be a mandate, I would say, within the last um, year or so. Um, we have only noticed that um, the way in which we go forward has to change. And we have to recognize that no longer do we act as an institution and say that this is how we will acknowledge certain issues. But if you are familiar with the climate of the Caribbean and where we stand in comparison to how hurricanes and natural disasters and how exposed we are, we can't say that we can no longer look at the, the environment around us. We are susceptible to hurricanes, we are susceptible to droughts, um, uh, rising sea levels and so on. And as an institution that focuses primarily on SDG 13, we have recognized that our students must be aware of the realities around them in that regard. And now, as I would have mentioned, the challenge of the industry was that, yes, you are putting out students who know how to do um, accounts, but how is accounts going to be sustainable for my institution when the sea levels are rising? How is it going to be sustainable for my law firm or for me as an engineer? Uh, what type of engineering will I be able to do, which is you know more secure? And Anna mentioned previously that it's it's a situation where they have been um mandate mandates that come from the top down. Now we've recognized that right there in the middle is where we have to operate. We have to operate with our students, we have to operate with the industry, we operate with higher level executives, um, institution and externally, because we as an activist university um, is, is how we operate. So yes, the environment um, and maybe whatever else may come or as a result of the data and the innovation and the research that is going to say we need to focus on this is going to be the reality. Um, and just to mention, um, since Sonia mentioned it, University of the West Indies is, re is finalizing its climate justice strategy. Um, so we as an institution um, is preparing and finalizing the climate justice strategy for the entire Caribbean region. So I just wanted to mention that since I didn't mention it before. So thank you. Thanks, Kevin. That's really great. And I think that shows a bit the conflict uh, that yeah, Alejandro was pointing at and that you're, you're also experiencing at your institution, that climate is such a pressing issue. And um, I think uh, we all also agree that this is definitely one of the as it is, needs to be tackled first, um, climate action, but then it can't be really done without the others. So there has to be some some sort of balance needs to be found um, as well, working with that. And I really like the, um, the point that you made about governments and about working and preparing um, students for the job market. And I, there's just as a side note, so we worked on a project on uh, green jobs um, and we had some webinars also with um, other or partner organizations and UNEP, United Nations Environmental Program like two years ago, I'll send a link. So there's actually a guidance document for educators and institutions, um, what they then recommended. It was also um, yeah, a multi-stakeholder project, how to best prepare students for jobs. And actually in the end of these discussions that we had, um, uh, we came to the conclusion that all jobs need to become sustainable jobs and need to sort of meet ESD. So also the accountant and also the, the lawyer and um, the architect and the engineers um, and the communications managers and project managers. And so we're coming to my, uh, my role, for instance. So it's really something that, yeah, that, that's not just one job, but it should, should spread also then across the different uh, professions, how we, how we think about it. Um, Zania, was there something that you wanted to connect to to the to the discourse at this point? Yeah, I think yeah, similar. I think it's about seeing climate action and ESD as not separate, but almost ESD as the vehicle for climate action, and really thinking about so ESD is so focused on skills development and the competencies that it can in encourage uh, learners to develop systems thinking, critical thinking, futures thinking, self awareness, you know, values thinking 
all of which ultimately support someone to take climate action. So I think it's really about communicating it as uh, the vehicle for climate action as opposed to sort of separate agenda. And um, yeah, it is it is tricky to kind of um, to be able to communicate that and to you know convince senior leaders that it's part of it's it's all it's all really the same thing. But I think it's looking maybe at that skills bit of ESD and saying no, we're actually supporting students to develop skills through ESD that can help them, help them to take this. This kind of necessary action um and i think on in terms of employability as well um esd skills the competencies the i think there's seven competencies that are highlighted are um so transferable so in the uk the competencies that esd aims to encourage are also the top uh employ the top skills that employers are looking at or looking for currently and so i think it's about communicating those benefits and communicating esd as simply just relevant good education and perhaps I could even go as far as to say that if we're not accessing ESD we're not accessing relevant education for our time um, so hopefully that's uh answers your question Alejandro and um provides some yeah insight that's great yeah um, I find it very very interesting here for exchange um I'm wondering so just as an open invitation for all in the room you can also contribute either in the chat or um take the floor and say something um so yeah not not wanting to force anyone to speak but it's we, we still have some time left so we can talk about some examples and we can address maybe um some question yeah Matilda I see please if you if you would like to take the floor Hello, thank you so much um it's been very very interesting hearing the different perspectives I think I'm from the UK, um, I'm from Nottingham University, um, and so we come from a very UK bubble and perspective. Sorry, the sun is blinding me, <laughs> I can't see very well. Um, I guess my question, it was kind of reflecting on what Kevin was saying, and then just what Sonia said as well about um, looking out at your sort of your physical setting, your community, your geography, and that leading to climate action. I suppose my question is if anyone's got any tips of how to best engage both students and staff when often we have our blinkers on and we don't feel like we're being impacted physically by climate change or environmental issues or social issues um, or even economic issues. Um, and so, I mean, in Nottingham is in the middle of, of the UK, we're not close to um a coastline so we can't see sort of coastal erosion sea levels are not impacting us um, we're quite a privileged university as well so i think people have different perspectives on their their social and economic um experiences and situations and sort of my yeah my question is what what can we do to take our students and staff over that their sort of their blindfolds almost um and really start to engage them and realize that actually even though we not, might not be sitting here with floods or heat stroke, that this is a global problem that we're all part of, if that makes sense. Thanks so much, Matilda. Yes, absolutely makes sense. So who wants to who wants to try uh, answering that, that question as well? Um, oh, Anna's going ahead, yeah. Yeah, so I just wanted to, to comment on that. I think we are sometimes worried about it because we might be privileged there are things that we don't understand and we have also to understand that privilege is not necessarily a bad thing so we just need to understand that we have a different perspective of the thing and they then engage with the other groups to understand the situation that they have so when we talk climate action for example in the case of costa rica it is very common that you will have this academic research project you would go to a community and model or use different types of tools to address climate change. Uh, but it is not very common that the researchers would be engaged with what are the impacts of drought or extreme flooding in, in, in a community. And that's part of the problem. So we are talking sometimes from the perspective of the physics of the problem, the numbers of it, but not really understanding the socioeconomical aspects of the impacts. So once you get to be more involved with the community and understand what actually the numbers of the impacts mean for the people, then first you have much more credibility in the first place, but then the way in which you address the questions is totally different. So having better questions 
and solving better a problem starts from understanding the community that is suffering the impacts, regardless of whether you may have or not a privileged background. Thanks, Anna. That's so interesting to to think about that in that in that uh, perspective. Kevin, I think you wanted to also uh, come in here. Yeah. Um. And it it this is where I I want to applaud um University of Costa Rica for having having that insight because they work very closely with their community. Um. This is something that even us within the, um, the Caribbean, the University of West Indies, I know you, uh, UCR is also in the Caribbean, um, but it's it's a situation where they've, they've had that ability to go out into the community and and speak closely to the sectors that are involved. Now, to Matilda's question, um, you ask them. It's, it's, it's as simple as that because what you would recognize is that while the evidence around you may not be as simple as, oh, it's too hot, or, you know, we have extremely, you know, unseasonal weather, they know someone who's been affected by climate change. They know someone who's, who's um, you know, not living a normal life as it should be, whether they are from a part of the world, maybe in the Middle East, um, Asia, um, the European continent, Caribbean, they know what the realities are like for their friends, their family, and so on. And then I'm sure that there's many scientists around you within your various faculties that can point towards the evidence to say, you see that black line on that graph? That's every single day that, you know, the planet has been hot since, you know, 2024. And then you can point to them and say, we need to do something about this. This is your reality going forward. We need to address this. And that's where ESD comes in. Because now you're being able to foster that within them and say, you know, you we've shown you the evidence. Now, what do you want to do about it? And I think that's something that we can look at going forward. So I think that's my response to that. Um, I could clarify a bit more if you wish for me to, but I think that's... Um, as as simple as it can get. Thanks, uh, Kevin. Well, I think I, I'll give the the question back to Matilda. Is have you have we answered your question, or do you want to have yeah, no, a that's bit brilliant. more clarification on that? Okay, <laughs> thanks so much um, for coming in as well. Um, yeah, I was also wondering because we've talked a bit about leadership and engaging and strategies. Um, if if our speakers or someone from our audience also wants to has an idea or a good example um how how would you do that where do you start if you're like based at a faculty or if you're a student what is a, a practical advice because they're just working on a project we're calling tips for stgs so uh, i think kevin knows uh, what i'm talking about but maybe the others not um, and we're trying to give like practical advice for people to where to start um so is there, is there something that that um that you would want to say in like very very short and very easy Maybe Sonia. <laughs> so it was the question, like how you, how you can start to do this work to embed sustainability in teaching and learning. For example, yeah, like if, if people are really like saying, yeah. I don't see this happening here, or I want to be more involved, like where do you look? Yeah, so one thing that we, we recommend um, as a really helpful initial point is a curriculum mapping exercise. So because we're a student-led organization, we uh, all of our curriculum mapping is very much a student-led approach. And so it's a, it's a really helpful way for you to get an initial idea of what actually exists within teaching and learning within your institution, um, looking at the SDGs, but also looking more widely at ESD and the competencies associated with that. So we're not just looking at what students are learning, but how they're learning, which I think has been a key theme. Um, in this conversation. Um, and so a curriculum mapping exercise, there's there's loads of different methodologies out there. Um, we also deliver one, so happy to chat more if, if anyone's interested. Um, but it's a really helpful way for you to, A, um, get a baseline understanding of what exists within teaching and learning, um, B, have an evidence base for conversation, to start this conversation with um, other lecturers or other students or senior leaders, and if it's a student-led approach, approach, having an initial way for students to begin that leadership and to have that, that ownership. And then you can use those findings and kind of identify pockets of good practice, identify strengths, identify challenges, and you know 
use those findings to make um, make progress and, and make your next uh, step. So I think that's um, a really helpful initial step if you haven't started anything, or even if you you know have started this work, um, it's quite a tangible, concrete thing that you can do. Thank you, Sonia. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. And we're also having some some of the ideas already shared in the chat. And I think communicating and teaching people how, or the students how to communicate and having informed opinions is a super important um, element to that as well. Um, I'm just going to share also a link to, to UNESCO publication on skills uh, and competencies for SDGs. So um, I also find it super helpful to see what are actually like very concretely the, the skills that we are talking about. Um, maybe, um, I don't know, if Anna, if you would like to come in and uh, connect to any of the, the points before, or if, if it is not possible for you, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. So I think perhaps the main challenge now is how to properly commit to the goals without being afraid of making changes in our universities. Because I think there's still some resistance on that. And, you know, I was reading in the chat in kind of informed opinion and how to prepare the students to have more uh, information about counteraction and so on. And that will also would require not only changes in the curriculum, but also providing the students and also the teachers with the tools and the information for that. So I think perhaps the, the most difficult thing now is how to, you know, avoid being afraid of the challenges that we have. And, you know, some of the changes have to be more structural in the universities. Can I come in on that really quickly? I think um, I, I really like that point, Anna. And I think something that happens, in, I think, in, in a lot of institutions is like a fear of discomfort. And this work is challenging. This work is uncomfortable. And I think maybe an acknowledgement that it is scary, challenging work, and it's OK to feel that way. And it's OK to be afraid of our institutions changing because they ultimately need to change quite a bit. Um, to to you know to respond to the the challenges we're facing. So I really like that point, and I think being more comfortable with discomfort in our institutions is really important. Yeah, thanks both of you for for that point as well. Um, yeah, I don't know if I don't didn't see any any other concrete questions or um or interventions at this point. So just we have a couple of more minutes left, but I thought maybe I could just go briefly back to the second Mentimeter question that we ask. And uh, maybe in the meantime, there will be some other questions. If not, I think I will also ask our speakers to to wrap up and say some some concluding words. Uh, but I think it has been a very great and inspiring um, discussion so far. Um, so let me just um, pull up the second question here, because we've talked about examples, and I feel examples are really important that we really see of these examples of good practices and activities, um, what could be done. And um, surprisingly, or actually I already expected this to, to turn out um, mostly balanced, and we probably need we need all of these um yeah elements and these activities the project with the students we need to have these like awareness that this is an issue also for leadership so we can have their buy in and we ha can have the support and hopefully also resources to um start these projects at the university um having some research and also really understanding what what is it that we need and what is it that um students want. Um, and maybe employers want as well if we then look at the at the skills um, for the labor market. Um, which which tools and resources do we need? So again, I think I, I invite you to have a look also um, at, at some of the shows that I've shared, or we, we also work with a toolkit and for instance, the Responsible Futures Program. So it's really also looking like what, what are things that I can go back to and where I can read and, and I can admit also, well, maybe I don't have that information and but I know how to find that information. And that's something that I must admit from our work um, at the International Association of Universities, working with university leaders, leaders that are changing quite a lot um, also every couple of years. They don't always say that they might not have the knowledge. So we have to find uh, a way to, to um, make them also understand that the, the work going on on ESD is important and that it is something that... Uh, yeah, needs to needs to be integrated into into all activities as well, and trainings and events like the this event here, or like the SDG Bergen conference. I've been participating like three years in a row. I think it's always a yeah pleasure and um, a very great platform to um to bring different people uh, together as well. So yeah, let me just close that one as well. I did have some 
the slide here with some other resources. I think we will try to share also the slides and the recording, um, in particular to the Responsible Futures Program, um, to the IEU cluster network and the portal, and um, also our SOS and IEU social media. But of course, also feel free to to share and to connect. Um, um, yeah, after the session um, on on the conference platform or on 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 other um, social media pages as well, and just. In terms of time, I wanted to say thank you already to everyone participating and to the speakers. Uh, and I would like to give the the floor and sort of the last the uh, last round of words um, to our speakers. So maybe I can start with Kevin, and you can just say very quickly some of your conclusions or takeaways from the session, and then hand the ball uh, to Anna and to Sonia next. Sure. Um, I think looking back and reflecting on many of the discussions here. We've seen so many avenues in which you know we can we can go, um, and I think it's encouraging for many of the persons here, whether you're speaker or participant, um, viewer, so on, um, that it's it's a situation where you see the realities of a changing institution ahead of you. You see sometimes the needs in terms of your students and staff and what needs to be done. And I think going forward, it's going to be very integral in incorporating ESD um, for many, many persons. It's, it's a situation where we need to adjust the ways in which our curriculums are, are structured. Um, it's important to to more or less have a diverse aspect of our programming. And we also have to prepare our students for the times in which we are going to face going forward. Not that I'm a prophet of doom or anything, but just to adjust to the changing dynamics of the global environment, whether it's for employment, whether it's for your own personal development, um, it's just good to know about what the realities are of a global economy. And I think it's, it's, it's very important that sessions like this be held. And I thank the IAU, um, SOS UK, Belgian, um, for being able to, to organize such a conference because many of the participants in reading through the chats, very informative, very crucial discussion. Um, and it's, it's always a wonder and an informative approach whenever, you know, sessions like these are held and it doesn't get, you know, this is my point of view, that that is my point of view, but also it's a situation where we can, you know, allow for good discussion. And I, I really enjoyed this session and I, I thank everyone for joining in. Um, so I think at this stage, I, I will say thank you for inviting the University of West Indies. And, <laughs> Um, I think I'll hand over to Anna at this point. So thank you very much. I like to thank the opportunity of this space. And I think my message would be try to make sure you can meet in the middle so no one is left behind. I think all the times we discuss with these issues, we need to make sure that we are just right away looking for equity and making sure that everyone is included and integrated. That's great. Thank you so much. And then Sonia, yeah, I'll let you close. Um, yeah, thank you so much as well for um, facilitating and planning the session and Kevin and Anna for your really interesting um, examples and endpoints. Really quickly, I just think like just the whole institution approach is so important for this work. It it ensures that all the voices that need to be heard, all the stakeholders are heard, can co-create um, what learning looks like in our institutions. And it means that this work is long-term, sustainable, relevant, and engaging for everyone. So really want to emphasize the importance of not working in silos, but using that cohesive whole institution approach. Um, back to you, Isabel. Okay, thank you so much. And we're perfectly on time. And uh will close uh, the session. So thank you again. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed the session. You will um, follow the activities of University of West Indies, Costa Rica, SOS, and IAU. And yeah, enjoy the rest of the, the conference. And uh, yeah, see you maybe soon. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.